on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Modern homo sapiens bring to the Americas this predatory hunting lifestyle at which we've become really superb. We sort of proceed to demolish the place. That Pleistocene extinction, this is a human-induced event of mammoths and other megafauna that were present on the landscape at that time due to our sophistication as hunters, but also due to their ignorance of human beings as hunters. There are white-tailed deer and beavers and elk and black bears, but because of the size of the native population, the numbers of all these animals appear to be pretty suppressed. Human beings need to eat. Hunting and gathering for 6% of us in North America, yeah, that works. Agriculture isn't a really clean solution. If we want this world to be rich and preserve something of a 21st century, we're going to have to submit and probably celebrate some restraint as a way for us to have it going into the future. Episode 173 of the Wild Fed Podcast, In the Shadow of Extinction, with Dan Flores, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Man, I'm excited to introduce a new product at SirThrival.com. We've teamed up with Hammond's Black Walnuts, and after a year of behind-the-scenes work, I'm proud to finally introduce Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder. This is the most exciting new product I've seen in my 15 years in the health food and nutritional supplement industry. I've been using it for over six months every morning in my smoothie and loving it more each day. It fortifies my blended drinks with 17 grams of wild protein per scoop. But the story is even more incredible because the black walnuts in our protein powder are hand foraged from wild native trees. There's no fertilizer, no irrigation, no pesticides used anywhere in the process. No agricultural land is used either. So no habitat is disrupted to produce these nuts. All the foragers are volunteers paid by the pound for their harvests. In other words, when you invest in Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder, it's not just an investment in your health. You're investing in wild lands, wild species, healthy ecosystems, and the people who tend to them. I can honestly say it's hands down the most ethically sourced and produced protein product ever made. It's also the cleanest because we use the same ultra pure CO2 extraction process used in high end cannabis extracts. This yields a light colored raw protein powder far superior to the ones made with higher heat expeller pressing. It's a very fine flour too, so we've used it in more than just smoothies. My wife's been baking it into cookies and muffins, turning them into wild protein fortified snacks, and she uses it in her oatmeal at breakfast too. I'm excited to see all the recipes you come up with using this really versatile ingredient. Wild North American native trees, 100% grown and processed in the USA. Sometimes it feels too good to be true. We've managed to bring a wild, hand-foraged, native North American food to people in a format they can easily use to fortify their diets daily. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire product line and use the coupon code WILDFED to get an additional 5% off your order. Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder, the first wild protein powder on the market ever. Do you need an antidote to the metaverse? We just launched our newest t-shirt design over at wild-fed.com. It features our antidote to the metaverse tagline on the chest, a wild fed badge on the sleeve, and two tarot style cards juxtaposed on the back, one modeled on the tarot card known as the fool, who's wearing an oculus and absentmindedly walking off the roof of a building with a bag of fast food in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Next to it is a card based on the magician who's juggling four implements, a fishing rod, a rifle, a trap, and a foraging basket. It represents our belief that a life that includes the outdoors inoculates you against believing that an artificial experience of life could ever replace a natural one. You see, for us, being wild-fed, hunting, fishing, and foraging is about a lot more than just getting our groceries. It's an antidote to the metaverse, an act of rebellion against the transhuman agenda that is leading humanity to abandon the natural world in favor of wearing screens over their eyes to live in a virtual one. We choose the natural over the artificial. We choose an antidote to the metaverse. We choose to be fed by the wild. Check out our new shirt at wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.
Well, it's finally here, the last interview of the Wildfed podcast. Now, I'll be back next week with our producer Grant to do a final wrap-up episode, but as far as guest appearances go, who better to take us out than Dan Flores? And on what better topic than his new book, Wild New World? Dan was on several episodes ago to discuss this book, but at that time I was still reading it, and it was only a few chapters in. Dan suggested we reconvene after I finished it, and I'm grateful he did because the book is incredible. Even, dare I say, required reading for anyone who's been following the journey of this podcast. It's not just a history of North America and the animals that live here now, the extant animals, and the ones that were here before, the extinct ones, but it's also the story of the human predator crossing through Beringia and being unleashed on a hominin naive megafauna assemblage and the impacts that that would have here over the preceding 20,000 years or so. It traces its way through the Clovis and Folsom cultures to the post-Ice Age extinction events that led to the great mass of cultures we refer to as Native America, up to the point of contact with European explorers. Then what follows, as we all are painfully aware, is the Great Dying that led to the loss of some 80 to 90 percent of the indigenous people of this continent due to diseases that Europeans had developed significant immunity to but were novel to Native America. And of course, colonization and westward expansion. This then gives way to the most substantial human-induced biomass reduction in known history, the denuding of the land and the commodification of its wildlife, which comes with its several tragic, high-profile extinctions. This part of the book is both compelling and at the same time gruesome and even loathsome to read about. It's truly a blemish on the history of this country and our species, and something we're a long way from reconciling still. Eventually, this leads to the beginning of the modern conservation movement, which carries us through to the present day, exploring both its sometimes less than savory origins, but also its tremendous wins, like the Endangered Species Act. This book walks us through to the very present with some speculation about the future. When I spoke to Dan, I'd only read a few chapters, and those were some feel-good pages. I didn't really understand what was to come or how it would shake me up to the core. I didn't expect it would cause me to reevaluate many of my assumptions or make me audit my own practices and how they relate to this bigger picture history. It's so easy to forget that we live not as isolated points in space-time, but rather in a continuum, embedded in a fabric of living history. Without context for what has come before, we can inadvertently focus myopic on where we are now. Conservation is no different. While our methods for wildlife management are light years ahead of where they were just a century ago, one thing I've learned making this show is there's still a long way to go. It's far from perfect. All that said, humans are and always have been, as long as our genus has existed, predators. Not just dietarily, but behaviorally. Those of us that hunt and fish know this in a very intimate way. The idea of giving that up isn't really an option for most of us. Despite the hopes of the planet's vegan contingent, who believes we can just implement a species-wide dietary experiment overnight on the human population without any malnourishment consequences to ourselves or our children? I've been down that road, and it leads, in my opinion, off the rails, and into nutritional bankruptcy. So it seems to me that we need to learn to balance our needs, wants, and desires as a predatory animal with our needs, wants, and desires for an intact fauna and healthy ecosystems. No easy task. And it's one that's not just centuries, but millennia in the making. It seems to me that this decade could be characterized by a now hyper-connected and networked human ape coming to terms with itself, its past, and its future. Those of us who champion a meaningful ecological trophic connection to wildlife are going to have to do the same. I hope when the dust settles, we can still hunt, fish, and forage. Since, as I've stated on this show dozens, if not hundreds of times, I think this is essentially human. Who knows where all this leads, but I'm grateful to Dan for this book and the incredible work that must have gone into writing such a sweeping ecological and environmental history. I suspect this one is destined to be a classic. Dan is, no doubt, one of the most important environmental writers of our day, and it's an honor to have him back on the show, and especially as our final interview. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be back next week for one final, more intimate episode of the show. Thanks so much for following along on this journey, for your support, and for your listenership. It's meant the world to us. Now, here's my second interview with Dan Flores on his newest book, Wild New World. Dan Flores, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be with you again, Daniel. Thank you. 
Yeah, I really appreciate your time today. I want to <clears throat> I want to give the listener a little background here. You were on the show uh, a couple months ago, and um, I had started reading Wild New World, and I think I was probably three, four chapters in. And uh, you know, sometimes when you're interviewing somebody every week, it's like it can be hard to. It's a lot of reading, you know. In the in my modern life, it's like man, it's hard to keep up with. So I wasn't all the way through, and I started interviewing you, and you sort of very graciously said, "You know what? Sounds like." You're about three chapters in. Why don't you finish the book and I'll come back on. So thanks for saying that because the rest of the book unfolded in a way that I had not anticipated. And uh, I am just uh, kind of reeling from how I feel (laughs) inside from everything I just read. This book is fantastic. Well, thanks. uh, Thanks so much. And of course, thanks for reading all of it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's happened with Wild New World is in part uh, as a result of the the cover, which of course sort of highlights a mammoth on the front, it's given uh, some people at least the impression that it's, it's just a book about the Pleistocene, uh, about extinct animals. But uh, as you know well from having read it, this is a uh, this is a book that essentially gets the story all the way to the spring of last year. So yeah. it covers. Uh, this uh, kind of epic story of humans and animals in America up through the present. I mean, I certainly do uh, try to spend a little time, a good bit of time, a couple of chapters on the Pleistocene and on uh, the early story. But most of the book, as I was mentioning to you the last time I was on with you, is actually about uh, the later story, the time from uh, really from Europeans arriving in North America down through the present. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you read it all. It's quite an indictment of not just our culture, but I think of the human predator in a lot of ways and ways that aren't just, they're not easy to sort through. You know, I think, um, I think back to when I was younger, I spent about 10 years as a vegan, a little longer. And, um, you know, then I could never have imagined I'd go on to have a television show about, you know, that includes me hunting and, and you know, living that kind of a lifestyle. Um, so it's been an interesting progression. But back then, um, I saw very clearly human agency as, you know, this incredibly destructive force in ecology. And that really motivated me to alter my lifestyle. And then, you know, where I sit today or where I sat up until maybe a week ago, <laughs> was, I felt like... You know, I was one of these people who had gotten so um, comfortable with a lot of the things that we say in the world of conservation about the yeah. role hunters play. And um, and there's been a lot of things, you know, and I've done about 175 episodes of this podcast talking to a lot of people in wildlife management. So there's always been these things nagging at me in the back of my mind. They didn't quite sit right. But all in all, I felt really good about the story. I got to say right now, I'm in this moment of flux where I'm not really sure where I land on a whole bunch of things. Um, maybe we could kind of pick through the book a little bit, kind of piece by piece. You know, we talked a lot in the last time you were on about the first part, which kind of takes us through from Chicxulub the Comet to, you know, the the Clovis and Folsom cultures, which are really fun to read about. You know, I really enjoy that stuff. But once we get up into this time where Europeans arrive, you know, we we've heard a lot the story of what happened with the the clash of cultures. But the story of what happened to the fauna here, I don't know that it's really been told as succinctly as it's been told in this book. Um, and the story is just riveting, shocking, and like I said, quite an indictment. So um, I guess I want to kind of start off with um, talking a little bit about this idea of humans as predators, because this is a really important part of the story that you tell. And uh, obviously, that wasn't in the beginning, that wasn't really a problem, right? We were a wonderful predator on the landscape, but over time, there's been some challenges that have emerged from that lifestyle. Yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, as you know, I, I try to do uh, the um, Jared Diamond, uh, Yuval Harari, big history thing with this book. So with humans, as with the the acquisition of our, our native beast area in North America, I start, uh, I try to start back at the beginning uh, when we uh, emerge out of the evolutionary stream uh, in Africa uh, and uh, uh, and become over time as we move out into the grasslands of uh, equatorial and southern Africa, we gradually become take on the task of becoming 
uh, first scavengers. Uh, and as you know, we, we actually, um, I, I take some pains to describe the fact that we still preserve in our physiologies and our genetic makeup legacies, not only of the, the hunting uh, story that uh, propels humans around the world, but also of that uh, earlier scavenging period. We have uh, the APO gene, for example, which, uh, you know, is a, a, a somewhat troublesome gene for modern humans because uh, at least one version of it can bring on the early onset of Alzheimer's. And yet that gene originally was all about enabling us to be scavengers and to actually eat foods that were uh, partially decayed without making mm. us so sick that we died from it. So we preserve many of these legacies that we've, you know, we sort of ignore today, uh, but they're there. I mean, I think I may have even mentioned to you when we talked the first time about, uh, you know, this runner's high that we get, which is actually from, it's a legacy of a time when we were chasing animals and pursuing them in our early stage as hunters. So the, the hunting stage is, uh, it succeeds the scavenging stage in, uh, stage in human history. And it's the one that we really bring to the game as we end up moving out of Africa, uh, evolving into modern Homo sapiens, uh, and bring to the Americas, our, our last great continents on Earth that uh, the human species will find because they were the most remote uh, North and South America were the most remote from Africa. And so we don't finally stumble on them until about 23,000 years ago. But we bring this legacy of a predatory hunting lifestyle at which we are really, we've become really superb at it. We've developed big brains as a result of ingesting protein uh, from our kills. We've developed the ability to work uh, communally, which is one of the things that helps humans become superior hunters, is unlike, uh, say, the big cats or like leopards in particular, we are not solitary. We tend to, uh, to hunt uh, as groups, uh, more like wolf packs. And so we're really, really good at it. And of course, we, by the time we get to the Americas, we've come up with uh, a flint technology, particularly in the form of fluted points that uh, flint points that the Clovis and Folsom people used starting about 16,000 or so years ago that were, I mean, just absolutely the best sublime technology that hunters had ever developed in that 40,000 generations mm. that we have been doing yeah. this. And so what we brought to the game were it was a mixed bag of things. We had obviously uh, acquired a sophisticated speech and, a, and an ability to communicate uh, at uh, a level that uh, uh, superseded those of other hominins and other uh, other species that were out there in the world. Most species have communication, but we of course had perfected that to a fine art. And so we bring all these kind of uh, really superb skills to the game, we still preserve, I'm convinced, by things like the uh, the rock art that uh, we see, for example, the cave art in Western Europe at places like Chauvet Cave that I talk about in Wild New World. I think we preserve that that initial, that first great religion that we had, which is a religion of being smitten by all the life forms around us, uh, our portrayal of animals in that cave art is very clearly an awestruck kind mm -hmm. of portrayal of creatures that we regarded as probably almost almost supernatural in a way, and we probably had relationships with them that were that bordered on the religious and supernatural. Um, one of the things, of course, I talk about in the book that persists in human art down through. Uh, at least among native people in America down through the last century, is this idea of humans and other creatures being able to, um, to merge together 
into a combined species that's part human and part animal. And in art, we refer to that as a therianthrope. And there are many famous ones around the world. One of the ones I really love is uh, the one at Chauvet Cave, which portrays a woman who from some angles uh, is a human female. And from other angles, when you see uh, that particular portrayal, and it's on a, a limestone pillar in Chauvet Cave, it's a bison. And so it's this combination wow. of humans that, with other animals that we bring to America as part of our, our religious background. But we also, of course, have this, this idea that, which is what propels us around the world, that we're looking for animals that have had no experience with humans as predators because they're relatively easy for us to kill. And that's the allure of moving into mm -hmm. the Americas, it's uh, an opportunity to find creatures that have no prior experience with us. And so it, these two kinds of uh, notions that coexist in the human mind 15,000 years ago, when, for example, the Clovis culture begins to arrive and, and get its start something like 13,000 years ago, uh, is not only a kind of a religious veneration for the animals that we're hunting, but also so many skills at doing so that we're able to become super predators. And that story, you know, which we talked about at, at some length the last time I did an interview with you, translates along with several other ideological attachments that um, old world humans out of Eurasia acquire. The Judeo-Christian religion is one, an idea that comes out of the great chain of being, the hierarchy of animals with humans on top and everything else arrayed below us uh, is another. And of course, the global market economy is yet another. And so we bring all those things to a continent that after the Pleistocene extinctions are done, uh, as you know from reading that chapter I do on that 10,000-year period, I call it Ravens and Coyotes America, uh, when native people, uh, with, as far as we can tell, only one extinction during that time, managed to preserve the biological diversity of the continent. That's what 500 years ago, old worlders are going to encounter. They encounter, once again, a discovery of the Americas, this uh, these continents that are away from everywhere else and that are hard to get to. And when old worlders arrive, they arrive in a place where native people for the past 10,000 years have preserved an intact biodiversity and bringing all these ideas along with them, plus this old legacy of humans as predators, we sort of proceed to demolish the place and uh, and proclaim it you know, the arrival of civilization to boot. When when we first arrive in North America, at that time, we're big game hunting specialists, right? So it, it would be a mistake to look at modern day hunter gatherers who have a, uh, you know, a suite of smaller animals uh, and a lot of plant foods and all these things they're working with. Um, the landscape's so different. But during this Pleistocene era, we're hunting big game um, as specialists, if I understand it correctly. And additionally, you kind of, uh, you talk about the idea that that extinction, that Pleistocene extinction, because there's so many theories that have been presented, but in the book, you're, you're pretty clear. You feel this is a human induced extinction event of, you know, mammoths and other megafauna that were present on the landscape at that time do mostly you know, due to all of these factors you just described, our sophistication as hunters, but also due to their ignorance of human beings as hunters. Um, and that stands in contrast to uh, a lot of high hunting apologists who want to find other reasons why that might have happened. Is that fair to say? Is that a fair assessment of, of your Yeah, I think, that's, I think it's a fair assessment. I think you've presented it correctly. I mean, I, I compare it, as you know, to uh, our inclination today, and we've, we seem to always have had this inclination to uh, look, to search for some other reason why global climate change is happening than ourselves. 
we just sort you could turn of turn on the news to... right now and you'd hear several you'd hear that right depending on what you yeah. turned on you'd hear oh, right now it's the chinese it's a long-term cyclical thing with the sun it's like we you know we have a lot of reasons and it's it is seems that that we have this like inability to take responsibility sometimes in our culture right? We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, I'm proud and excited to share that Wild Fed Season 3 is now airing on Outdoor Channel Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern as part of their Taste of the Wild block. This is our biggest and best season yet with adventures ranging from coastal Maine all the way to tropical Hawaii. You'll see familiar faces and meet new friends that are dedicated to the pursuit of wild foods. Come along with me for prairie dog hunting in the Dakotas, the iconic alewife run in Maine, gathering and feasting with the foraging world's most renowned expert, Sam Fair, invasive species hunting on the rugged island of Molokai, and my wife Avani's first hunt too. If you don't have access to the Outdoor Channel on cable, you can watch it live right along with us on Friendly TV. That's F-R-N-D-L-Y TV dot com. They have a seven day free trial and the monthly cost is just $6.99 a month. We can't wait to share all these new stories with you. Thank you so much for your incredible support. Now, back to the show. Yeah, we we look uh, almost desperately for other explanations rather than confronting our own culpability. And I think um, that's really what a lot of the folks who have uh, tried mightily to come up with uh, different explanations for what happened uh, in the Americas uh, when humans first arrived have tried to do. The, the problem with it, and I, I will say that, uh, you know, I've, I'm following mostly – uh, what seems to me to be kind of an emerging consensus uh, in this story uh, as presented by uh, people like uh, Ross McPhee, the, the uh, emeritus uh, director of paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, who wrote a book in 2019 uh, that covered some of this same ground. Uh, what we're sort of coming to is that the other explanations that we've devised just don't manage to be convincing ultimately. Disease and climate change ultimately are those two big yeah. ones, I assume? Yeah, and, and of course the problem with disease when you're talking about the complete elimination of species is diseases don't commonly do that sort of thing. They don't wipe out entire species. They mm -hmm. will wipe out the susceptible members of a species, but uh, they virtually always leave some group that for whatever the reasons of natural selection tend to have some slightly enhanced uh, resistance to a disease. And so what happens is that there will be 5% or 10% of the population that's left and it will emerge uh, and reproduce a population that's more resistant. But so disease as I mean, it, and it was Ross McPhee who first advanced that idea in 2006 uh, in an article he and several other people did. I mean, and, uh, and they have had to conclude that there's just really not any strong evidence for that being a workable solution. The, uh, the uh, climate suggestion falters on a number of kind of logical points, some of which have to do with uh, if, if it's climate, you don't see a selective extinction. You don't normally see the extinction of just big animals and their predators, mm -hmm. while everything else seems to be okay. If it's climate, it's a, a more consistent kind of application of the effect across all the trophic levels. And of course, that's not what happens in the Pleistocene extinctions in the Americas. And the other thing I would say about climate is that uh, what happens at the end of the Pleistocene is that the climate begins to cycle into a warmer and drier phase. And many of the species that had come out of American evolution, like camels and horses, uh, and then the, uh, the mammoths, that had arrived from Asia and joined the American bestiary, they all do really well in, in yeah, warmer right. climates. So you're producing a climate change that actually should produce an enhanced ability for those animals to, uh, to survive. And in fact, uh, 
at the very time the climate is getting better for them, they're going extinct. Now, what I what I argue, of course, in in the this particular chapter on uh, what I call Clovisia the beautiful, is that we don't really have. Uh, evidence that it's the old Paul Martin kind of blitzkrieg thing where humans wipe out everything, every big animal in sight. It's more kind of an individual species, some of which, for example, dire wolves that disappear in the Pleistocene uh, appear to have been outcompeted by gray wolves re- returning to the Americas. They had uh, they had first evolved uh, wolves all canids had evolved in the Americas, but gray wolves had migrated out of the Americas and had continued to evolve for a couple of million years in Eurasia. But they start returning about 30 or 35,000 years ago, and they seem to have outcompeted dire wolves and led to the extinction of that species. And there are, are several other species like mammoths, for example. I mean, they, for one thing, elephants have a really slow uh, generational turnover. The females don't become uh, able to have offspring until they're uh, 10 or 12 years old or 14 years old. They only usually have one calf. Uh, their gestation period is really long. So these are species that don't reproduce rapidly in the face of uh, any kind of new pressure on their populations. We also think there probably was a background uh, diminishing of elephant uh, populations around much of the northern hemisphere that had been going on for 70,000 years. So they're sort of getting, their numbers are growing smaller and smaller. And what appears to happen with, uh, for example, that story I tell about that last population of mammoths that's left on Wrangell Island, um, those animals. 4,000 years ago or less, right? Yeah, they persist until 4,000 years ago when we think that on the mainland, mammoths had disappeared uh, largely by about 10,000 years ago. But away from humans, with the climate nonetheless changing, they persist until 4,000 years ago. But what does them in is what we suspect may have happened with some of these other species on the mainland is they were isolated enough from other populations that their genetic diversity began to dwindle to the point where they suffered what biologists today call a genomic meltdown. They reached the point where they weren't able to reproduce and sustain themselves. And this kind of thing may well have happened uh, on the main line as populations of slow reproducing creatures, for example, like mammoths, were separated from one another, sort of like grizzly bears are today in places like Montana, where we have them in Glacier and we have them in Yellowstone, but they can't exchange genes because they're separated by several hundred miles. This same kind of thing uh, very possibly happened with some of the Pleistocene species. And then there are some that we still haven't figured out. I mean, we haven't figured out yet why horses become, having evolved in North America, become extinct here. But during the time that they're here, 56 million years, various members of their group uh, travel the land bridges across to Asia uh, and into Africa and into Europe. And they survive in Africa, becoming zebras and quaggas. They survive, at least small numbers of them survive in Asia, becoming Shezvalsky's horses. And they almost became extinct in Europe, uh, but at sort of the last moment before they were hunted to extinction, horses were hunted to extinction in Europe, they were domesticated. And it was domestication that saved them. But in North America, we lost all of them, and we we just really kind of haven't figured out exactly what that story is. And the same is true with camels. I mean, the the camels survive in the Andes in South America, but they don't survive in North America. And uh, so there are uh, paleontologists uh, and paleobiologists out there working on these stories and trying to figure out exactly what happened. Uh, so it's a it's a probably a multi-causal thing, but it doesn't really look as if our hopes that we've placed on disease or climate <laughs> are 
are going to to be the answer. It looks very much more like humans were right in the middle of of these uh, extinctions. Well, something that I found really fascinating was if you accept that as true, you go on to suggest uh, that the the relational eth- ethos that we see in surviving Native American culture with regard to the landscape and to the plants and animals there may be an outgrowth of what happened during that extinction event. In other words, you're sort of suggesting yeah. that the that the understanding that we need to steward this landscape to make sure we can sustain our own populations and that we don't cause these extinction events might be why when Europeans arrive here, Native peoples in North America are doing such a good job of stewarding their landscape and their fauna. Um, and that I just really hadn't ever heard that presented before. I thought that clicked in a way for me. It was like, that really made sense to me. So maybe you could explain that a little bit better than I'm doing. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's to some extent uh, speculative to make that argument, but the evidence for uh, the sustainability is there for all to see. It happened. They did this. And so there have to be reasons. And in looking back at this story, uh, and I will say this is one of the chapters that I pretty much had to recreate from whole cloth because there hadn't been anyone who had preceded me who had tried to uh, to come to an understanding uh, across time of the relationship between Native people uh, and uh, and animals in America over this 10,000 year period. So I, I looked for, as you know, I opened that chapter with uh, uh, sort of asking questions about how this was possible, how they could do so. And I came up with two or three answers that uh, I think uh, uh, are going to, uh, you know, 50 years from now, when people perhaps revisit this story, I, th- I think these answers are still going to hold up. One of which, of course, has to do with a ready recognition, it appears, on the part of the Native people who remain in the Americas that what had happened prior uh, with the Pleistocene extinctions had happened in the midst of the kind of rapid colonization that also happened when Europeans would arrive uh, 10,000 years later. And so with people who were now more settled on the landscape and had shorter feedback loops in terms of understanding the ecology of the world around them, they began to realize that in order to preserve North America as a hunting and gathering Mecca, what you have to do is ultimately keep your population level low enough that there are large areas reserved for the populations of the species that you want to hunt and that you want to coexist with. So I think there was a very deliberate attempt, especially by the hunting and gathering folks who prevailed for much of that 10,000 years, for at least 8,000 or so years of it, to keep their populations low enough to sustain the animals that were around them. I think there was also the fact that because there was less human population pressure on the animals that were available in North America, the agricultural revolution, the Neolithic revolution, came to North America much later in time than it did to places in the old world, like the Middle East, uh, much of Southeast Asia, and Western Europe. There, in the old world, the agricultural revolution dates back to between eight and 12,000 years ago. But in North America, we didn't begin to have an agri- agricultural revolution that sweeps across uh, uh, at least most of the eastern half of the continent and a good bit of the southwestern part until about 2,000 years ago. So we have many more thousands of years to sort of preserve the continent as a, as a hunting and gathering uh, kind of mecca for the peoples who are here. And the arrival of – the reason the, ri- the arrival of the uh, agricultural revolution is important is because settled populations growing plants and other crops – 
allow for human populations to increase. And when those human populations increase, you often reach a point where you can't really go back then yeah, to hunting yeah. and gathering. There are enough people on the landscape that the hunting and gathering economy is no longer that viable. So that was a major one. And then, of course, one that I spend a good deal of time in that chapter talking about, about the last third of it, has to do with the uh, the cosmological and philosophical attitudes that Native people bring to their relationship with the animals around them. And what, again, and this is somewhat speculative, but I think it probably is strong enough that it's going to hold up. I think what they essentially were preserving was this old human religion of regarding other creatures as part of a kinship community with humans, as being deities uh, to some degree in their own right. Uh, and so this, this careful nurturing of the relationship between humans and other animals. Uh, and I use ceremonies performed by Native people uh, to largely kind of flesh this out in that chapter, where whenever animals, for whatever the reason, become uh, thinned out, or they, as the stories often put it, the buffalo went away, or the elk went away, what Native people would do is to perform ceremonies that were designed to cause the animals to realize that humans still regarded them as kin. And those ceremonies then were part of this, uh, this kind of religious, cosmological, uh, philosophical relationship where other creatures are not just substandard, subhuman commodities in their world. They are actually living, breathing communities with whom humans have a kinship tie. And that enables, you know, I mean, we, we all, most of us admire the stories we've heard uh, about Native people having this kind of relationship with other animals. But I think it, it provides a practical application in the real world where if you consider creatures to be similar to you, part of your kinship network, then you're much less inclined to simply look upon them as, uh, uh, you know, the raw materials for making money in your economy. And that's pretty much how I think those reasons are the ones that I think that uh, we have this 10,000 years where when Europeans arrive, they arrive to a continent that is still brimming with virtually all the species that had survived after the Pleistocene extinctions. So, Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Europeans are making their way over. And the first folks that arrive find a world that's different than the ones that, let's say, the the pilgrims find, right? It's like the first, this was a piece of the book that uh, was very eye-opening for me. You describe some of the early um, explorations as... Uh, Kind of finding village after village after village, a lot of people across North America. Right. And while all of those animals are still, you know, extant at that time, it's not the abundance that we would find later, which was really fascinating to me. So at this time, if I understand it right, humans have very much, native peoples had colonized North America. They had, um, preserved species, but obviously we're utilizing them for food and resources. And so there was a very different balance than we would hear about later when it seemed that this was like a kind of new Eden that had been discovered, right? So can you exactly. talk us through that earliest stage? Because this gets real fascinating, particularly I was blown away by the idea that the disease epidemics that would come later would have an effect on climate. This was like such an eye-opening moment for me in reading the book. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it, it it it's all, you know, to me certainly writing this book. I mean, um, every page, the research for every page was a fascinating uh, effort to to untangle uh, 
a story, a narrative story that tracks through the entire book. And uh, this is, of course, one that I had to grapple with because I was aware of some of these very early expeditions. And the one I use as my prime example uh, in the next chapter when Europeans arrive is that of the, the experience of Cabeza de Vaca along the, the Gulf Coast uh, and into Texas and the, ultimately the Southwest. Uh, in the years from about 1519 to 1536, he's part of uh, the shipwreck of a Spanish expedition that loses all their ships and ultimately out of 600 uh, potential colonizers, only four uh, people are left, an African and three Spaniards who uh, find themselves on the Gulf Coast uh, in what is now near Galveston Island uh, in Texas uh, in the 1520s. And so they're there, in other words, a century before the Pilgrims and the Puritans in New England and before Virginia is colonized uh, in 1607. Uh, so these folks see a different America. And what they see is a part of America where the Neolithic Revolution has taken place. There are still hunters and gatherers, and some of the people that, that Cabeza de Vaca uh, and his comrades ultimately travel through are hunting and gathering people, but most of them are agriculturalists. They're, they're farmers. And that, of course, has allowed the population to go up. As I mentioned a minute ago, it means that the hunting and gathering lifestyle or economy is not nearly as, as uh, workable anymore. And so what Cabeza de Vaca reports uh, in the journal the account of this experience that he keeps and later publishes is of being in a world where there are certainly all the animals are there. There are white-tailed deer and beavers and elk and black bears and everything is there. But the numbers, because of the size of the human population, the native population, the numbers of all these animals appear to be really pretty suppressed. The only time he really gets among people who seem to have a great plenty, uh, as he describes it, are the people of the, the cows. And what he's referring to uh, when his travels take him to the far, the southern edge of the southern plains, he gets among people who hunt buffalo for a living. And these people, he says, are are really rich and they have a population of animals that's enormous. And so they have no no problems at all surviving really well. They have everything they need. They're willing to gift to the Spaniards uh, anything they want. But many of the other peoples he has traveled through before then uh, are not really uh, as wildlife wealthy as our old stories about a you know a virgin American Eden of wildlife uh, have led us to believe. Now, what happens, of course, and this is the way I try to tell the story in that chapter, between the time that Cabeza de Vaca is in America and the time that Northern Europeans began arriving. Uh, in uh, Jamestown, Virginia, in uh, Massachusetts, is that Europeans like Cabeza de Vaca and others who had worked along the shorelines and had traded with native people without maybe making an attempt to colonize had introduced old world diseases. And native people, as we all know, having been isolated from the disease epidemics of the old world of Eurasia, were completely susceptible to these diseases. I mean, I tell a story from one of the early Europeans who's uh, probing along the Virginia coast that every town they visited, he said, within a few days after the Europeans were there, in this case, they were Englishmen. After they were there, they heard stories that most of the people in the village they had just been to had caught some strange disease and they were dying all over the place. So what had happened then between the arrival of Cabeza de Vaca in the 1520s and the arrival, say, of the Puritans in Massachusetts in the 1620s is that old world disease epidemics were beginning to sweep through North America and 
What we think from what we call the great dying that took place is that a native population that had remained at something between four and five million people over that many thousands of years before Europeans arrived, I mean, and that was a population they had deliberately tried to hold low, it's suddenly going to be devastated by old world diseases that take out as many as 80 to 90 percent of the populations. So what you get by the time the French and the English are settling in the in America is a native population that has been reduced from somewhere between four and five million down to what we think was fewer than a million people, about 900,000 is what we think the population was then. And what that produces is this whole suite of effects. And the one that I wanted to, what I wanted to do with that that account of this recently published article from 2019 about how we think that that, does, that population collapse in the Americas may have even produced climate change to the extent of of uh, setting in motion what we call the Little Ice Age, is that when you take a population up and down the Americas, I mean, with a, a far bigger agricultural population in Mesoamerica, Mexico, and then farther down south into South America, I mean, the speculation is we had a population from uh, Alaska to the Tierra del Fuego of as many as 55 million people in the Americas. And if you take out 80 to 90% of that population of people who had been cutting down trees, building fires, heating their homes with firewood, suddenly with forests beginning to grow up again, what you have is an alteration in the climate that produced a cooling effect that may have set in motion the Little Ice Age. And the reason I told that story is because I wanted to include it as part of the suite of sort of unintentional effects from the arrival of old worlders that also produce this effect in North America. And it's kind of the one that speaks to the whole issue here. The suppression, the catastrophic drop of the native population from some 5 million north of Mexico to 900,000 means that suddenly American wildlife is going to undergo an ecological release into much, much larger numbers. And it's those numbers that Europeans, a hundred years after Cabeza de Vaca, are going to see and report back to the old world that North America is this virgin continent and an Eden of animals. What they're seeing is an misunderstood effect of their own presence that has suppressed <laughs> the native population. You couldn't make this up. I mean, it's it's an incredible story. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out too for the listener that I think with COVID having just happened, we have this sense in our minds of the old, the infirm, those with comorbidities, but these diseases weren't that selective, right? So this is taking out 80, 90%, but it's also taking out very healthy people, very young people, this whole yeah. suite of diseases. So that's like one component. Um, and then to your point, Europeans arrive you know, in droves later on, not only to this massive boom in animal populations, but thinking that the native populations are relatively low compared to what they had been 100 years ago, right? Yeah, exactly so. I mean, they they see America as being sparsely inhabited by native people. Um, I mean, the the Europeans are on the scene when they see whole villages just die, as one of the accounts says, like rotten sheep lying in their villages like rotten sheep, dying of all these diseases. And so there are lots of accounts, descriptions by Europeans of of uh, sort of like that earlier one uh, in the 1580s along the coast of Virginia, where every time we went to a village and left it a few days later, we hear that half the people in the village are dying and everybody else has caught some strange disease that they've never encountered before. So there are plenty of, of European accounts of all of this happening, but nobody understands at the time what causes uh contagious or transmissible diseases. And so 
all the Europeans can see is that the native people are dying and they, the descendants of uh, tens of hundreds of generations of old worlders who have already been through all these diseases and who represent the survival of those diseases in the old world past, what they see is we're fine. <laughs> we're perfectly healthy. All these native people are dying. This must be God clearing the continent for us to take over in their wake. Providence, they thought it was, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a line on page 145 of the book. You say, so in the colonies, one of the first celebrated freedoms associated with America was the freedom to take wild animals. And this part, uh, you know, that's a hard one because, I mean, I – we still kind of have that sentiment today. Um, but I want to also impress upon the listener that this is like a pre-polymer era. Like everything is made. I was thinking the other day about how we still have leather and cotton, you know, we don't see as much anymore, but we still do. But we're in that era where all the, our clothes are starting to become plastic fibers all the time. And I was thinking about how in 10 years, 20 years, when you tell a little kid like, when I was your age, my clothes were made out of plants and animals. It's going to sound kind of like yeah. shocking, you know, yeah. but this is a time where everything is made out of natural materials, right? So yeah, animals are the resource that we make all of our goods out of. But I think the most tragic part of the story that follows is that a lot of the just sheer decimation of wildlife is not about what we need to eat as much as about like fashion and status. Um, and that part is so uh, detestable. That's the part where I feel so indicted as a human because it's like we're still doing these things, you know, in different ways. But it's like this is about hats and robes and we go through and basically uh, annihilate and extirpate and exterminate species. Uh, and, and I like in the book too, I just want to say this one other piece that you take us through in stages. It begins in the Northeast, you know, um, with the beaver trapping and, you know, um, this kind of thing. And then we move westward and it's another suite of animals. So you kind of take us through in segments in eras. And I was wondering if you kind of walk us through that a little bit. Well, I, I think I would start this by saying that the, uh, the cosmology, philosophy, and religion that old worlders bring to the America is drastically different than the one that native people had held. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I argue is that virtually everyone uh, 400 years ago, uh, say if we take 1620, the arrival of the Puritans in Massachusetts as sort of a starting date, although there are earlier ones, but if we take that one as kind of a starting date, so that's, we're in the 2020s, so that's 400 years uh, in the human past, and everybody interprets the world, native people, Europeans through religion. This is how they understand how the world works. And while native people have this religion of kinship with other creatures, which as I said a few minutes ago, I, th I think is probably, it comes out of our ancient past. What Europeans brought to the game was a 2,000 year old religion out of the Middle East, the Judeo Christian tradition, that was a religion of herding people, people who had uh, domesticated goats and cattle and sheep. And for some 10,000 years, probably. Uh, and finally came up with a, a, a holy book uh, some 2,000 years ago, they had perfected an economy of being herders of animals. And that, of course, changes a lot of one's perspectives about the world. Native people virtually had, except for dogs and wild turkeys and things like that, they virtually had no domesticated animals. And so they had no reason, for example, to decide that all predators should be destroyed and wiped out. Herding mm -hmm. people, on the other hand, regard the predators of the world as a blight on the human economy. And so everywhere they go, they attempt to destroy predators. What, what informs this religious tradition out of the Judeo-Christian ideology is 
is a, a couple of things that are really important to understand. One is an idea they inherit from the Greeks, really. It's called the Great Chain of Being, which is a hierarchical order of uh, how the heavens and the earth works with God in the heavens surrounded by angels, humans as the next step down the hierarchy, and below that, arrayed in order of their usefulness to human beings, all other creatures. Now, one of the things about the great chain of being that becomes important in this story is that not only do Europeans bring it to the Americas and hang on to it uh, with clenched fists right up until the early 1800s, but it's an idea that argues that the earth was created as a perfect thing by a deity. All the animals, all the birds, all, everything was created by a deity in the beginning, and all those things will survive forever. So it's a perspective on the world that does not allow for extinction or for driving animals to their complete disappearance. So that's one part of the tradition that Europeans bring. Another part of the tradition, of course, in the Judeo-Christian story is that humans are exceptional. We're exceptional to everything else because we're the only uh, entities on earth made in the image of God, the only ones with an everlasting soul that allows us to have an afterlife. Everything else, all other creatures are soulless. And as the book of Genesis puts it, unto your hand are they delivered. They are mm -hmm. all there. All the other creatures are there for humanity's use. And uh, the, the the Bible even includes, along with this, a fairly interesting to me story, which I I hearken back to several times in telling the account of wolves in America up to the present day. That predators, and of course, remember this is a herder's religious document. Predators were actually a phenomenon of. Adam's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden, there were no predators harassing the animals that he needed. Once he's the so-called fall takes place and Adam has left the Garden of Eden and enters a fallen earth, then suddenly the world uh, is enjoined with lions and wolves and in the Americas, coyotes and grizzly bears and all these creatures that are sort of alluded to in the Bible as being creatures that really are despicable additions that come about as a result of the fall. And then one final <laughs> One final, actually, there are, there are two now because you mentioned one of the ones I want to get to. But so two final things. Europeans arrive in the Americas and the United States is founded in, in the 1770s at exactly the time when Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations that argues for market economies and capitalism as being the most natural economy to humans. And what those kind of economies, of course, argue when you've got a when humans are exceptional, you can't produce humans can't produce extinction, and you've got a bunch of animals out there that are created for your use. That means that it's easy to convert beavers and white-tailed deer and elk and buffalo and passenger pigeons and great auks and on and on and on and on into simple market commodities. So. Finally, add what you introduced us uh, to this whole story with, the fact that particularly for, for the British and the French, to a slightly lesser degree, the, the Spaniards, not only had they already wiped out all their big charismatic animals, the British Isles hadn't had wolves in it since the 1400s for example, and there were just a few remnant wolves in places like Spain and France. But because of the feudal system uh, 
the feudal economic system that had prevailed in Europe prior to the arrival of Europeans in the Americas, ordinary working class people, the peasant class, had been forbidden from hunting the remaining wildlife that was in Western Europe, all of which was preserved for the use of the kings and the nobles. I mean, as I tell the story, this is why we have this this great epic that we all have all seen in many different guises of Robin Hood. What Robin Hood is a peasant deer poacher in the king's <laughs> forest. And that's why yeah. the Sheriff Nottingham is chasing him all the time. The because, warden, right? <laughs> yeah, he's the game warden and these animals are preserved for the elites. Ordinary people don't get to kill them. When these people with this kind of tradition, who of course have hated it all along, arrive in the Americas and feudalism doesn't come along, suddenly here are all these animals released by the disease epidemics and the suppression of the native population, and they don't seem to belong to anybody. I mean, even though the native people try to convince the Europeans, for example, you, are, you must understand the deer are like your cattle to you. For us, the deer are our cattle. Europeans would have none of that. And so suddenly here is this continent brimming with wild animals with a population that brings all these ideas over. And what results, of course, is, I mean, I have to kind of say it because it's the truth. When I mean, I'm a, a historian of environmental issues and a writer of environmental issues. When I was working on this book and on an earlier book of mine called American Serengeti, I looked around the world and I could not find another example of the level of wildlife destruction that took place mm -hmm. uh, in North America between 1600 and about 1920. I mean, there's not another example that compares to what we did uh, in North America in 300 years. So it's a kind of a it becomes a shocking story. I mean, you know, just as a one shorthand way of saying it, passenger pigeons, which mm. were the most numerous bird species on earth when old worlders arrived in North America, those birds had been in North America for 15 million years. Their populations had been in the billions for 50,000 years at least. Wow. Native people had coexisted with them for, well, all during the Pleistocene and certainly for that 10,000 years after the Pleistocene. So you can say Native people had coexisted with them for 20,000 years. Passenger pigeons are unable to survive 300 years of our presence. Mm. Once we're here, the writing is on the wall. Those birds are going to be gone, taken out by all of these, uh, all of these threads that I've I've just sort of laid out. You kind of poignantly mentioned in the book too. I think you say something like forty five years ish. You know, is how you missed the passenger pigeon by about forty five years. So I, I, yeah. I want the, I think for the the average listener, the the mammoths seem far enough away. But yeah. I want to impress upon people how recent some of these other losses were, because that happened very recently. And I also want to touch upon, you know, your mention of capitalism, because it's interesting that the word capita is, you know, the Latin for head. It, it refers to head of cattle, essentially, like counting right. your wealth by your head of cattle. So to reinforce what you're saying about that herder's religion and that herder mentality, and then we bring this herder's economy as well. Um which we call today, to, you know, to this day we call capitalism. And then I just want to point out this other thing that's just so sad to me to think about because these chapters are they're they're invigorating because it's like ah the, you know to get the to get this knowledge is so valuable because you wake up in this world trying to figure out what's going on here and it's like this is very recent history so it's very invigorating but it's also gut wrenching at the same time and. Um, the, the saddest thing to me, all these hats, all these robes, all this clothing that, you know, these animals were turned into, that stuff is long gone. 
You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, it's, long it's not like it has, it's not like, you know, there might be pieces in museums here and there, but it's not like yeah. we even made something that would last or something valuable, or we could in some way look at it and go, well, it was worth it. It's like, now we're just trying to undo what, you know, but it, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the things I do argue and I offer up examples in several instances, uh, f- uh, three that just quickly come to mind are among, uh, you know, the plume hunters in uh, Florida and along the Gulf Coast who are killing snowy egrets and uh, roseate spoonbills and all for their plume feathers uh, to sell in New York and Paris and London. Um, And I also, of course, talk about uh, some of the buffalo hunters and uh, I talk about uh, the wolf poisoners uh, in from the 1890s on into the 1930s, one of the things this kind of ideology and economy does do that probably does still linger to the present, it enabled significant numbers, large numbers of rural Americans to rise into the middle class by killing these creatures for profit and money. And so in all of those instances, I described the story of, you know, one of the plume hunters in Florida who basically wipes out one of the last big uh, snowy egret rookeries on the Florida coast. But he makes enough money selling the, the plumes uh, to these uh, fashion designers in New York and, and Paris and London that he's able to buy an island, build a house, furnish it and buy a yacht. And so, I mean, one of the references I make to that is that it's sort of like a 19th century cocaine deal. If you pulled a really <laughs> great Florida yeah. cocaine deal in the 20th century, you might be able to do the same thing. Well, 100 years ago, the way to pull one of those deals was to wipe out an entire rookery of snowy egrets and roseate spoonbills, kill uh, tens of thousands of birds at their nests while they're trying to raise their young because that's when they produce the plumes and you can rise into the middle class. And, you know, the as for the buffalo uh, hunters I talk about, two brothers uh, 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 on the Texas plains are going to end up with the proceeds from all the buffalo they kill buying a ranch in Colorado. And one of the, the uh, wolf poisoners uh, who became sort of uh, – you know, he became kind of the avatar, the one that all the other uh, people who were killing wolves for bounties wanted to emulate. He ends up buying a ranch and stocking it with uh, 300 or 400 herd of blooded Hereford cattle as a result of all the wolves he killed. So it's actually one of the ways that people uh, became middle class Americans. And you know, we don't preserve any kind of memory of that in modern American history, that this is one of the ways it happened. But 100 years ago, people did preserve it. I mean, there were people who were the descendants of some of those buffalo hunters, for example, who were embarrassed enough about this in the conservation period of the early 20th century when Teddy Roosevelt was president, that they destroyed the records that their ancestors had left. Yeah. Yeah, because they were embarrassed by the idea that their move into middle-class society had been uh, precipitated by their ancestors wiping out tens of thousands of animals for money. Nonetheless, a lot of the records are preserved and the numbers of animals oh, yeah. are astonishing. I mean, truly, yeah, astonishing. Lest, yeah. lest anybody thinks we're exaggerating, it's astonishing. But, but then this really exciting thing starts happening in the book where you start to uh, the rise of the natural sciences starts and um, Darwin's story becomes part of it. And, y- you know, you seem to quite intentionally draw a parallel between the resistance to these new ideas um, and the resistance we see today as we continue to try to further ecological understanding and our role in it. But, but um, one theme that keeps emerging for me is it's so easy from where I sit today on the shoulders of all the people who've come before and all the cultural knowledge that's the legacy I've inherited to be reading these stories. And it's so obvious what's happening and what's going to happen. And, you know, reading it, you realize these people just don't know. They just don't know what they don't know. Um, You can't, right? So it's like having grown up in an era where evolution's been accepted 
and ecology is a developed science. Um, some things that I just accept as as plainly obvious were so hard to conceive at the time, or it may be impossible to conceive of at the time. But this very exciting era takes place where there's a change in American sentiment. And um, that leads to the conservation era. And I, I don't know how easily you can kind of tell that story quickly, but but yeah. there, a massive a massive change takes place. It does, and I will say that uh, you know from the arrival of of Europeans in in North America, one of the stories that I tell side by side with this this market hunt that uh, produces such destruction uh, in so many creatures, side by side, I tell the story of the the uh, first naturalists in America, uh, the uh, Mark Catesby's, the John James Audubon's, the William Bartram's, the Alexander Wilson's, all these. Uh, people who are fascinated with creatures that Europeans, of course, have never encountered before and dedicate their lives to studying them, writing books about all the new animals that, in the, that are in the Americas, painting them in the case of Alexander Wilson and John James Audubon and even Mark Catesby, too, who is an early British colonial naturalist. So I track that story throughout. And as the, you know, the story of America moves westward, I also talk about the naturalists that go west, Lewis and Clark's, uh, Meriwether Lewis's role as a naturalist, for example, and a whole host uh, of others who are observing all these brand new creatures that uh, Europeans had never suspected even existed, and they become iconic emblems of America for the world, like the American bison, for example, which becomes sort of a shorthand for the wildlife of the Americas. But what begins to happen really when Charles Darwin uh, writes on the origin of species in 1859 is that we finally, the Western world, the, the so-called Western scientific world that has accompanied the arrival of capitalism and uh, the great chain of being and all that, it's finally produced a genius like Darwin who is able to see and able to demonstrate scientifically, in effect, the same insight that ancient humans and native people had had, that we humans are not exceptional. We are out of the evolutionary river, just like everything else. And we are, in fact, kin to all these other creatures that for hundreds of years we've been regarding as just commodities that we could destroy without a second thought because we're exceptional. We have souls. So Darwin finally gives Western science a catch-up in this ancient philosophy of humans as being kin to other creatures. And of course, Darwinism among a certain segment of society, including in America, begins to produce, well, what it produces, of course, is the science of ecology, which in the United States has its origins in 1915 with the American Society of Ecology, which has its first meeting. And so we have the first attempts to try to put together a scientific understanding, as you mentioned, that you take for granted now. And to be sure, you know, many of the people who had gone before, they didn't understand this. Some of them believed, okay, the great chain of being says we no animal can become extinct. But we were seeing extinctions happen. We lost the northern hemisphere. Not to hemisphere. mention the bones that they're finding, right? It's like oh, they're yeah. finding all of these bones at the same time of these Pleistocene animals, you know. Absolutely. So they're sort of like, oh, wait, what are these? Yeah. So what? What's the story here of the these bones of creatures that aren't around anymore? What happened to them, and why did they disappear? And can humans cause? animals now to disappear. And as I was about to say, we had the experience already in the 1840s of losing our northern hemisphere penguin, a bird called the great auk. So people who were really aware were understanding that, wow, it looks like not only can things become extinct, but humans can certainly be drivers of that extinction. So what, you know, to sort of make the story short and get us up to uh, kind of the present, which is what the last uh, couple of chapters in the epilogue in the book cover, is, of course, by 
the early 1900s when Teddy Roosevelt, uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt and William Temple Hornady are at play in sort of redesigning the whole nature of how Americans look at wild creatures. What I argue here, and I think it's, it's, uh, there's no argument that can be really made against it. What we get with the forerunner of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is called the Biological Survey, and which many of the state wildlife agencies model themselves on, are agencies that are dedicated to preserving the animals that Americans want to hunt. And everything else out there, including predatory birds like eagles and hawks and owls, and of course, wolves and coyotes and bears and and uh, all the other predators, those can all be destroyed because after all, this is what Europe did. And our idea in the early 20th century is that we are a clone of Europe after all. We are bringing civilization to this new continent. And so we're going to create a country that's a, a clone of England or France. And in those countries, you don't have things like grizzly bears and wolves and big predators and eagles and hawks and things. You just, those are, those are not animals that civilized countries have. It takes the ecologists who began to do battle with the biological survey in the early 20th century, certainly by the 1920s and through the 1940s, these ecologists like Aldo Leopold and the Murray brothers, Olas and Adolf, who are studying for the first time, crazily enough, the role that wolves, for example, actually play in the world. And as Adolf Murray is realizing when he's writing the wolves of Mount McKinley, my God, these animals have been here and these relationships I'm observing have been here long before we Europeans ever arrived. They go back into antiquity. So we're trying to figure out exactly how America is going to function if we end up with no predators. It's going to completely change everything. And that sort of thinking through the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, as this new science ecology is putting Darwinian ideas into practice, is what finally gets us during the 1960s and 1970s, the so-called age of ecology, to something like the beginnings of an Endangered Species Act, which is, becomes our great Hail Mary to finally stop this attrition. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, it, the Endangered Species Act isn't passed. It's, it's passed in 1973, exactly 50 years ago. It's not passed soon enough to save passenger pigeons or Carolina parakeets or bison as wild animals. I mean, we still don't have bison as wild animals in America. Uh, and it's not even passed soon enough to save ivory bill woodpeckers, which, I mean, they were still around. I was born at the, in 1948 in Louisiana. There were still ivory bill woodpeckers in Louisiana in the early 1940s. But as far as we know, despite the fact that yeah. we've thought several times we found them here and there, the last seven pairs of ivory bills, one of the largest woodpeckers in the world and one of our charismatic animals, last seven pairs of them were taken out when the Singer Sewing Machine Company, which owned the woods where those seven pairs lived, sold the logging rights to those woods to a Chicago uh, logging company. and all the timber that housed those last ivory bills was cut down. So wow. finally, the, it's the Endangered Species Act of 1973 that becomes our, our Hail Mary. And I mean, man, it has done yeoman's work for us. It has, we have now, I mean, the Endangered Species Act, of course, not only lists uh, animals, uh, mammals, birds, uh, invertebrates, plants, as threatened or endangered, it also provides for recovery programs. And we have so far since 1973 recovered 54 American species under the Endangered Species Act, including probably most famously our national symbol, bald eagles. 
And now, of course, (laughs) which is on everybody's mind, the recovery programs are finally, as the ecologists realized back in the early 20th century, we're finally getting wolves back on the American landscape. And they're completely changing ecologies uh, everywhere they're introduced. So Aldo Leopold, before he died in 1949, he had just written a Sand County Almanac. And one of the things Leopold was arguing for, he said, why are we emulating Europe with all our wildlife policies? The Europeans have wiped out all their charismatic animals, and they did it before the science of ecology even existed. They just did it based on folk traditions. We've got a chance in America to do something that's American, that's completely new and unique in the world. And I think, especially with the Endangered Species Act tracking through to the present, that's what we're finally trying to do. Be prior to Leopold, some of these early, you know, quote unquote heroes of conservation, Teddy Roosevelt, um, Hornady, man, it's a mixed bag with these guys, both heroes and villains. You know, I, yeah. this was really, this is stuff's really hard to read about, especially <laughs> because you see how our modern, um, game regulatory agencies still emulate this kind of view that they had then. So, you know, to me, it's like, you know, I knew that Teddy Roosevelt was a very serious hunter, but you see some of these numbers of animals he'd kill on a trip, like 1,500, 2,000 animals where it's like, wow, man. I mean, this is kind yeah. of outrageous. Like, what are, what is this bloodlust? Um, and I guess I just want to point out that so much, that the same tension that existed between the sort of pure ecologists and those who wanted to preserve the game animals at the expense of predators and songbirds, et cetera, et cetera, that tension still exists in our modern hunting culture. And I'm, this is where, you know, I'm the most confused, I guess, having read the book is I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, I first learned about you on Steve's podcast, the Meat Eater podcast, and I think you were on Rogan as well once, right? I was, yeah. I was on Joe Rogan uh, in 2017. Yeah. So I think a lot of folks who don't know you from the academic world will know you from pop culture, from from those podcasts, which are, are so heavily listened to. And, you know, those guys really championing modern hunting and conservation as well. And I'm like, now I feel like oh, I'm just, a, I don't know how to quite word the question, but like, how do you see the role? Well, let me back it up even more. Human beings need to eat. <laughs> and you know we need to eat and we there's these two food acquisition methods there's agriculture and there's this hunting and gathering concept and of course as you point out you know north america was having both kind of simultaneously they're not mutually exclusive but agriculture itself isn't like necessarily a really clean solution because agricultural land eats up huge amounts of habitat it tends to especially in our modern culture monocrop everything you know the Animals are out competed by their, yeah, use a lot of water. And, you know, you end up with this kind of aquaculture situation we have now where, you know, this is very damaging to the wild fish. And, you know, here we are raising domestic fish, but we're feeding them wild fish. So it's not really like a win win. Um, Hunting and gathering, obviously, we've seen that, you know, it's great, you know, for 6% of us in North America, yeah, that works, I guess, but like it's not sustainable for a population like we have too. And, I'm looking at how conservation works now and I'm like, man, this is a bit of a skewed model um, and it comes out of a a horribly skewed model. So we don't exactly have a system today that's been uh, sublimated and purified by what we understand now. So, you know, you kind of say at one point right toward the end of the book, you you point out that that a lot of environmentalists aren't necessarily anti-hunting, that they understand that the role, there's a role for it. Um, yeah. But it's just a kind of a brief passage. And so I know you have uh, friends and, and mentees that um, are some of the most vocal proponents of hunting today that exist. And um, I don't sense you to be an anti-hunter, um, but obviously this predatory relationship we have to the ecological world uh, has to be reckoned with at some level. And I'm just curious where all that lands for you today and how you kind of see us moving forward in a way that humans can still, you know, meet their protein requirements, but also we can still share this planet with all these incredible species. 
Well, I think that, um, first of all, I would say to your listeners that, uh, no, I'm, I'm not anti hunting. Uh, I mean, I, uh, uh, as recently as, uh, a decade or so ago, when I was still living in Montana, about uh, every three years, I would uh, buy a deer license. And I will admit, uh, I didn't go hunt deer in part because I didn't have to. I had a, I lived on 25 acres in the Sapphire Mountains. And uh, so three different times at spaces of about three years when I was in Montana, uh, I shot uh, a young deer, uh, a yearling mule deer usually, uh, in my horse pasture, uh, in order to, uh, put it in the freezer. Um, that of course is a different kind of hunting than, uh, a lot of other things that I talk about in the book, market hunting <laughs> Very different, yeah. trophy Very hunting. Different. Uh, it's a different kind of thing. So, uh, th- this book is not anti hunting. What I think, uh, w- what I really hope for, and I, I know that it's fallen on receptive ears of quite a number of people, including Stephen Rinella, of course, who has read it and who had me on a podcast uh, when the book first came out uh, back in the late fall. Um, What I'm trying to do is to have modern Americans realize what this story is. And it's not just the hunting community that I think doesn't know this story or understand it is maybe, I think probably people know some parts of it, but I don't think they understand it or understand how it happened and why Mm -hmm. it happened the way it did. And I don't think that uh, the ordinary community of, uh, uh, you know, of Americans, including environmentalists, for example, uh, really understand this story very well either. I think this is, somehow been a story of the American past that we have somehow avoided looking at uh, very closely. Most of us kind of know that one time there were a whole bunch of buffalo and then there were almost none, but we saved them. And at one time (laughs) there were a lot of passenger pigeons and then they disappeared. Nobody is quite sure why. And beyond that, people probably don't know the stories of a lot of other creatures that I tell uh, in the in the book, because I obviously take the animals. One of one of my in, uh, intentions in writing this book was to take animals very seriously. So mm. they're serious characters in the story with their own communities and lives and cultures and and animals do have culture, of course, as I describe in several places and at some link in the epilogue. It's one of the things that links us to them. Today, one of the reasons we're not so exceptional as we've thought. But I've wanted people, especially people living now, who I think tend to look out on the world and think of it as quite normal, to understand that sentiment that Henry David Thoreau brought to the game when he wrote that marvelous passage that I I describe in the book uh, and use as one of the titles of a chapter to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. Thoreau had sat down, 1856 is when he sits down and he's reading these accounts of what Massachusetts was like when the Puritans arrived and realizing, holy shit, all these creatures that they saw, I hardly see any of them anymore. I don't see moose anymore. I don't see mountain lions anymore. I don't see wolves anymore. And he just goes through a list of of all these animals that are gone from Massachusetts, even white-tailed deer in the 1850s, he says, that he no longer sees around him. And as he continues with this thought, and this is kind of the way I want people to think of knowing the story I'm trying to tell, what he realizes is that he lives in an impoverished world. Mm -hmm. As he puts it in that incredible passage that he writes about it, he says, it turns out I'm that citizen whom I pity. It's as if I look up in the heavens at night and suddenly realize some demigod has come before me and plucked all the best stars and the best constellations out of the heavens before I ever get to see them. Or he said, it's like I go to a concert and listen to a symphony And suddenly someone tells me, well, you know, 
the timpanis are all gone from this. It was originally written with timpanis and winds and flutes, and those are all gone from it now. Mm. And what he concludes at the end of this is he says, I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. And that's to me what knowing this story is really about and understanding that we're living in a place where if everything had happened in a really good way and an enlightened way, we would still have flocks of passenger pigeons flying overhead. We would still have tropical parrots, the Carolina parakeets that were our most beautiful bird in North America that finally went extinct in the 1930s, still flying through the canopies of our forest. We would still have that strange toy trumpet sound that ivory bill woodpeckers made and that double whacking that they did on trees that was has been described probably 500 times in early uh, journals and memoirs of early America that none of us today gets to hear anymore because, of mm. course, those birds are gone. So what I've kind of tried to do with this book is to make people realize this unknown story and how it all connects to us as another animal on the planet. And the fact that at various times we made choices and we adopted philosophies and religions that maybe weren't the best thing for preserving an entire heaven and an entire earth. And then, as you know, from the conclusion of it, I basically argue or say in the, those last few pages, the last two or three pages, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to uh, let mourning for what I'm never going to see completely overcome me. And so the conclusion that that brings me to is I'm going to do everything I can in the life I have to experience as much of the natural world mm -hmm. that's left and do it now in my own lifetime. Yeah, I I really agree with that conclusion because it's sort of like um, chop wood, carry water. It's like it's just like what can you do? You know, you got to accept where we're at. You got to accept what's here, and you've got to live the best life you can live. Um, does it? Do you feel? And by the way, I just want to say too. I I wish this was a this should be you know required reading in any kind of American ecological uh, you know program because it's it's a pretty crucial summation of what's happened here. But um, do you feel hopeful? Do you feel pessimistic? I mean, there's there's a lot of this stuff still happening, and then there seems to be lots of glimmers of hope. Um, we're in this incredible time of flux, which uh, seems like we're wrestling with paradigms. Um, and then, you know, we're at this time where a lot of the stuff that we're doing to try to heal some of these problems also comes with a loss of liberties, which Americans always resist so much. So like, do you, yeah. you know, how do you see it playing out? I mean, you know, I know as an environmental historian, it's not your job to have the solutions to these. So I'm not trying to put that on you, but the book stimulates so many of these questions. Yeah, they do. And of course, you know, uh, being someone who, who tries to mine the the field of, uh, of older stories uh, doesn't excuse you from trying to make those stories uh, translate into the future. So, um, uh, you know, I would say that uh, to be sure, um, preserving biological diversity and genetic diversity in particular, which is another way of thinking of this, of course, which I talk about uh, a fair amount and wild new world um, because uh, I, I mean according to an article uh, that was in the uh, National Academy of Sciences in 2019 uh, we have as we spread around the world we humans have obliterated billions of years of accumulated earth genetics that it mm -hmm. will take millions of years to try to restore I mean natural selection is a hell of a tool in nature but um, our our migration around the world and our impact on wildlife has been of a level that it's going to take a long time to for the that kind of richness uh, 
uh, in genetic terms to ever recover on Earth. I think it will, whether we're around or not, because once again, natural selection is a hell of a tool. But uh, nonetheless, I will say that we have to deal with what what we have and where we've arrived. Um, you know, I mean, I've told the story in this book uh, that covers a very long span of time and takes us up to the present. And here we are at the sort of the launching point from where Wild New World ends, uh, where we have to uh, to consider how we go forward and what we do. And to me, preserving uh, biological diversity, because as the Endangered Species Act says, uh, its primary premise is other life forms have a right to exist. Mm. They have a right to exist alongside us. So it's one of the moral dimensions of the future we're facing to try to preserve as much biological and genetic diversity as we can. It's going to require, I mean, one of the things I say that you hinted at, Daniel, a a few minutes ago is we've still got a lot of momentum in American culture from the 19th century, where, I mean, for a lot of people, for example, I mean, I've mentioned this four or five times and used quotes four or five times in telling the story of the colonial period in America. The right to exploit animals in any way you wished and any numbers that you wished, many people in the United States regarded as one of their franchise freedoms. Mm -hmm. And finally, starting to, to control that, to put limits on that, Many people resisted. I mean, as you know, I tell the stories of some of those first game wardens. Man, they were getting killed, shot at, chased yeah. down. It was very difficult after several centuries of this American franchise right. I can shoot any damned animal I want anytime I want to, to convince people that in order for these creatures to exist in the future, we're going to have to put some regulations on this. But that's kind of the same uh, analogy that we're confronting going into the future now. There are more than 8 billion of us on the planet. The United States has 330 million people. I mean, that's uh, for Native America, that 10,000 years I mentioned, fewer than 5 million. Now we've got 330 million in the United States. And with that many people, the only way to preserve something of the natural world is you have to submit to some regulation of your freedoms. Because while we love to say, you know, we're the freest country on earth, what America is all about is freedom. Back at a time when you could just swing your fist wildly and widely as much as you want to, there went passenger pigeons. There went Carolina parakeets. There went great auks. There went millions of buffalo. So if we want this world to be rich and preserve something of a 21st century entire heaven and an entire earth, we're going to have to restrain ourselves and even submit and probably celebrate some restraint as a way for us to have it going into the future. Wow. The book's Wild New World, the epic story of animals and people in America. You know, a lot. Yeah, that word epic gets thrown around often when it's not appropriate, but it's very appropriate here in this title. It's well chosen. Uh, the book is really incredible. Um, so I can't recommend it enough. Seems like it's everywhere. Um, where do you uh, send people usually uh, in interviews like this to uh, get the book? Well, it's... Um it's in a lot of forms. Uh, there's an audio book version of it. There's a Kindle book version of it. Uh, and the cloth copies are still out, although the paperback uh, is in the works and uh, will be out uh, this coming fall. Uh, and uh, it's priced uh, at about nineteen ninety five, so it's a $20 book. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, this book, I mean, I try to tell this story very deliberately. I tried to hold it to under 400 pages. I just made it. It's 398 pages. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, it's probably worth $20, I would say. And uh, I so, so I yeah. usually, yeah, I usually send people to, and uh, Amazon, by the way, is selling the cloth version right now for twenty one fifty. 
Uh, so I usually send people to Amazon. I will say, however, it, it appears that uh, because my publisher, W.W. Norton in New York, has been successful at getting it in bookstores all over the world and uh, certainly all over the United States, it seems to be probably selling more in bookstores than anywhere else, largely by people, I think, who are just walking in and seeing it either in the window or on the shelves and picking it up and flipping through it and deciding, yeah, I think I'll take this home. Uh, but there are a bunch of versions of it out there. And uh, if you if you want to know a story about animals and people on this continent that is a big history story, uh, it's uh, it's really kind of the only thing that's out there that does it and it is at least a narrative i mean it's a it's a fairly readable i would say actually a very readable it, book because it, a lot sure of it is. consists of stories that i tell uh from the past yeah i think anybody listening to this show uh this is right up your alley a uh, fantastic book dan thank you so much for coming back on the show um and your graciousness with your time because uh i'm i'm really glad i got to talk to you again after finishing the book um really really enjoyed this one and looking forward to whatever you do next Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and thanks for uh, reading it to the end and having me back on. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a podcast guest or topic suggestion, or maybe a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host the Wild Fed TV show for? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one or two of the Wild Fed TV show, go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 20 episodes. Season three of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2023. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed shirts, hoodies, hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.